Oh, whoa, welcome back, AP. Didn't see you guys there, right? <laughs> That's a good dad joke. All right, so anyway, we left off in class talking about uh, civic humanism, right? We left off talking about the spread and proliferation of educational ideas, that being an element of civic humanism, right? That idea of taking humanism and making it kind of a multifunctional tool. I'm gonna go grab my power cord too so you guys don't uh, like die off, right? So uh, making it like a multifunctional tool, right? That can apply to people in their daily lives. We talked about how Baldassar Castiglione is gonna be the guy that spreads uh, and theorizes ideas about educational humanism, right? Um, or, excuse me, education being coupled with humanism uh, and being a component of civic humanism. Yeah. We talked about how he uh, wrote his book called The Courtier, right? And The Courtier is all about, uh, you know, how to act in the Renaissance, how to be a good person in the Renaissance, how to be somebody who could be so close to a king that you could advise them, right? So because that's what a courtier is, right? It is an advisor to a king or a component of their courtly life, right? And we'll talk about that stuff a little bit more later on as well. Anyway, uh, zzz, there we go. So... Oh, uh, we got really, really in-depth with all that stuff, right? And then we left off talking about how the political situation in Italy is going to get kind of dicey, right? Due to the fact that these northern Italian city-states all have independence, they all operate autonomously, right? And they kind of get really, really wrapped up and concerned with these ideas of power, right? And power fluctuations. Uh, particularly, like, if Florence is gaining too much power, Milan and Venice would unite together to smush their power down a little bit, right? Or attack them. Or as Malaya said in class, ah, right? So, exactly, okay? And that was a really good uh, quotable moment, right? I really enjoyed it. But the, one of the craziest cases has to do with Milan enlisting the help of Charles VIII of France, right? And Charles VIII of France was a very intense figure that was convinced by the Milanese government to actually have a full surface invasion of the entire Italian peninsula, right? And he actually ended up winding up going all the way through Italy and really causing a lot of chaos, right? Now, in times of crisis, right? Okay, in times of crisis, kind of take a second to like, kind of just imagine for a moment, you're like, okay, there's a French king with a huge army and he's about to run and wreak havoc through all of Italy pretty much trying to gain as much as he possibly can and as well as probably for profit and military uh, gain, right? There's a dude sweeping through Italy and we're not connected, so we can't defend each other. We're only going to defend ourselves. So in times of chaos, who do you turn to to show consolidation and uh, a lack of fear? Your government, right? So this kind of brought the government under that humanist microscope, right? This moment is a really, really good one to kind of take a second and understand how humanism is going to relate to the government and civic humanism and kind of move forward in like, how should the government respond? What's a good leader? What's a good leader in this situation? Do, do, like, do governments need to change and morph over time, right? And a lot of these ideas, remember, we are birthing our ideas back from the ancient Greeks and Romans, right? So, of course, Leonardo Brunei, the guy that linked uh, the decline of the West into the Middle Ages, as in with the death of Cicero, so of course Brunei is going to think that republicanism, the thing that Cicero was advocating for before his head got cut off and hung from the Senate steps, right? Um, he's going to link that decline of republicanism uh, with the decline of the Western civilization. So, of course, Brunei is going to say, oh, well, a humanist would always advocate for a republican government. And for those that don't know, republics were originally invented by the Romans, and it's this concept of rule by the people, right? Elected officials, multiple elected officials, multiple different departments, a huge senate that, like, where they rule for life. Uh, eventually, due to this thing called the struggle of the orders, uh, they ended up adding this thing to the, called the tribunes and stuff like that, but that's a lesson for another day. All right, so, but Brunei thought that republicanism was the best, of course, because he's a big Cicero fanboy, right? Now, Plato, of course, and Ficino, Marsilio Ficino, is going to direct his ideas to Plato ideas, right? And Plato believed in this person called the philosopher king, right? A wise, just, and intelligent leader that is going to be so smart and so well-educated that it'll also create a philanthropist in and of, in, of a sense, right? That intelligence is linked with goodness, right? And this is actually, there were historical 
um, images of some of these philosopher kings, right? Plato was dead long before this guy ever originated himself. That is Marcus Aurelius, right? Marcus Aurelius is considered to be the very first philosopher king, right? This person who read the works of Plato, read the works of Aristotle, read the works of Epicurus, read the works of <laughs> Dionysus, which we'll talk about him later on, uh, read the works of all these philosophers and then philosophized, 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 is that a word? All right. And was a philosopher in and of himself, right? So he was the philosopher king and ironically enough, he brought Rome to some of its greatest heights and actually managed it and he's considered the last of the five great Roman emperors, right? The philosopher king himself. So, of course, Plato was on to something. But remember, times are changing. Humanism is getting intense. And all are going to agree that a ruler is gonna, should be dignified, learned, and wise, right? Because Brunei, like, maybe he doesn't have a singular ruler. Maybe a Republican government has a lot of them. But he still agrees with Plato's thoughts that rulers should be dignified, learned, or wise, right? But Plato just believes it should be in one person, whereas Brunei believes it should be in a Republican-style government, right? So that's a common concept, okay? So getting back to what Charles VIII did, right? So this is the campaign of Charles VIII, right? See right here? Look at this huge, sweeping invasion route that he came all the way through, right? Went all the way through Rome, turned around, and then went all the way back to France, right? So the sweeping invasion of, of Italy by Charles VIII is going to cause a lot of chaos, right? And it's going to lead, in one particular city, to the exile of a very famous family, all right? So that family being the Medici. Very, very good job, Mary Salvaggio. I heard you over there, right? I heard you too, Morgan. I know you were shouting out. You are like, oh, if he's going to Florence, he's going to freak the Medici out, right? Well, the Medici were seen by the Florentinian people as being not equipped enough to handle this invasion, right? You're like rich bankers. You can't handle this guy sweeping through our like city-state right now. So in Florence, there was a power vacuum, right? Power vacuum is an important concept. We demonstrated it in class. When I left, right, one of you was like, oh, so we can do whatever we want, right? It's like, yeah. Power vacuums are an issue because a lot of times you are now going to lose one ruler, a vacuum of space is going to be created, and a sometimes worse one is going to enter that vacuum, right? And so the guy that is going to show up and start leading Florence during this time is a monk by the name of Giorlamo Savonarola, all right? So Savonarola, who looks like this, who looks really, really sketchy. I don't know whether it's the fact that he has no hair and a hood and he's kind of side-eyeing you a little bit. He literally looks like he knows that you just said something about him, but you weren't close by. It's kind of like, for example, if like Molly and uh, Malaya were talking about him for a second, and he just looks over at you like, you know what I mean? Like that's Giorlamo Savonarola, though. He's a little bit of a weird bird, right? Because he said, he's like, oh, God spoke to me, right? God spoke to me and told me that a new Cyrus was going to be invading these lands. Now, Cyrus being the king of the Persians, who the Jewish people actually looked on with absolute dignified ability, they thought he was great because he allowed them to come back. And that's another, again, again, a story for another day. But this Persian king was is prophesied in the Bible as being a really intense, great ruler. So Girolamo was like, oh, the next Cyrus is going to be sweeping through these lands purging of a uh, uh, purging us of these disgusting medici people because they're so vain right let's talk about vanity for a second right vanity vanity of course being relate to this idea it's like you ever heard the song like you're so vain right oh i didn't know i could do that all right so anyway but yeah you probably think this song is about you right so Vanity is a very intense concept that Girolamo is preaching. He's saying that the Medicis were more concerned about money and their possessions than they were about leading their people, right? And so due to this vanity, they are going to be ousted and purged out by this new Cyrus, Charles VIII, who's invading, right? So now, though, since they're gone, Girolamo then steps in and basically becomes the ruler of of Florence, right? Because when the Charles invasion caused the exile of the Medici because they didn't know how to protect the city, the family is going to be ousted out and Savonarola is going to take over Florence, right? But he changes everything in Florence, okay? Since he's like all about these fiery sermons and stuff like that, he's saying, ah, nice clothes, cosmetics, books, music, poetry, all of this is sinful because it is vanity and it's distracting from God. So as you can tell, Savonarola is a little bit nuts, right? Like, so like he's a little bit intense. He's like, oh, ladies, don't wear makeup. God doesn't want you to do that. And all the women of Florence are like, what? Like, so, and it led to this event known as 
the bonfire of the vanities, right? Where all the people in Florence had to show up with all of their clothing and goods and cosmetics and their books and their instruments and all their nice things, and they burn them in the square known as the Palazzo del Vecchio in Florence, which I've been to, and it's beautiful, and if you ever get a chance, it's very, very nice. All right, so the bonfire of the vanities is a really important moment because is Savonarola being a good leader right now? No. Humanists would look at him and be like, you're kind of being a little aggressive, right? Humanists are going to begin to look at him and be like, okay, we can't have this anymore either, right? So the Florentine government are going to reach out to the Pope at the time, and the Pope is going to be like, all right, you need to chill out, Savonarola. You keep saying God's talked to you and said all these things, but why would God come talk to you, just some monk, and not come speak to me, being the head of the church? You're really messing with the church hierarchy and power order right now. We're going to need you to stop and allow Florence to kind of get back to the way that it was, or else, right? And what ends up happening is Savonarola says, no, I will not relinquish this duty that God has bestowed upon me. So what's the Pope going to do? He's going to excommunicate him and then bring him in front of the Inquisition. Just in case you didn't know, the Inquisition is kind of like the Catholic Church Court, all right? The Catholic Church Court that tries and condemns people for heresy, right? So heresy or speaking out against the church, right? And since Savonarola refused the directions of the Pope, Savonarola is going to have to go in front of the Inquisition. He is going to be excommunicated. He is going to be tortured to the point that he is told to say, I didn't hear God. And then he's going to be burned at the stake. And ironically enough, guess where he was burned? At the same place that the bonfire of the vanities happened. So it's like, ha ha, you're so vain. Like, so it's really, really hilarious, right? Now, Anyway, though, but these invasions of Italy are going to continue because they wouldn't unite and centralize, right? And what ends up happening after Savonarola is gone, what do we have again? Yet another power vacuum, right? And so another family was brought in, which for some reason I can't remember. For extra credit. For extra credit for, you have a quiz that's going to be coming up next week, all right? So, but for extra credit, I'll let you know when it is. Don't freak out. It's not going to be our next class period. For extra credit next week on your very first quiz, for one of you, whoever gets in here soon enough and tells me the ruling family and figure that came in immediately after Savonarola, I'll hook you up, all right? But you got to get here first. You got to tell me first. It's got to be within the class time, right? So when the bell for class transition to E period begins, that is when the timer starts, right? And whoever gets in here first and tells me, you got it, all right? So you think about who those people are. Now, anyway, really quick though. So with that though, this other leader is going to come in, right? And since there's a new leadership in Florence and it's kind of working back to normal, but the Medicis aren't back yet, you're going to see a new city structure and it's going back to the way that it used to be, right? No more bonfires of the vanities, no more of this other stuff. But during this new regime, this non-Medici, non-Savonarola kind of little middle slot, this guy kind of rose to prominence. Now, he wasn't a ruler of Florence by any means whatsoever, but he's still extremely important, all right? His name is Niccolo Machiavelli, right? Now, some of your parents that I might be listening to this right now who are listening to me terribly sing and whatnot, thinking that I'm good at this, uh, are going to know that name. They're going to be like, wait, Machiavelli. I remember that name from high school, all right? Niccolo Machiavelli is the preeminent, uh, like, th ph philosophia, yeah, philosoph, uh, when it comes to civic humanism from a government perspective, right? Because he started out as a secretary to Florence governors, see, again, when the Medicis were gone, okay? So while Florence is being led by this middle, like, this middle group, okay, between Savonarola and the Medicis coming back, he started out as just a simple secretary. But he begins to observe a lot of the individual goings on. He's like, I don't know, the signoria doesn't seem to be working. But do we want necessarily a king? But do we want, so he starts kind of theorizing these ideas, right? Now, eventually, when the Medicis come back, right, and they're furious that people had been ruling while they were gone, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli is going to be arrested, tortured, and then eventually released by the Medicis, but banished from Florence. And while he's banished, he is going to spend the rest of his life writing and trying to get a job. And in this time period, after he was arrested and tortured and kind of coming up with his ideas, he wrote a book, right? In this book or in this book, this book was known as The Prince, all right? This is super important. Balthasar Castiglione is a varsity-level humanist that wrote The Courtier. Niccolo Machiavelli is like your starting point guard varsity-level like humanist. He is huge. He is super important. 
and he wrote this very, very famous book known as The Prince, right? And in The Prince, the central core perspective is what makes a good leader a good leader and what kind of government is necessary in the Renaissance era. He takes the humanist perspective and he applies it to leadership, right? This is the biggest key part about civic humanism, right? So the message from his central work is a ruler is meant to preserve order and security, right? So you are meant to keep your people safe and that it is not God who judges his rulers or judges the rulers, but it is that the people judge their ruler, right? The people need a ruler that is wise, right? Is wise and kind and just and do what's supposed to do what they're supposed to do to keep them safe. And he kind of in this, what's really interesting though, is in the prince, he kind of like rationalizes some ideas that some people might disagree with, right? He said that a king sometimes has to be brutal. A king sometimes has to lie. And a king sometimes has to be manipulative to keep his people safe, right? So it kind of advocates for this Swiss army king who might be kind of sketchy, right? Like, so like, but in the long run, you're gonna end up running into somebody in college at some point who's gonna wear like a beret, uh, he's gonna be in a coffee house, uh, he's gonna have bongos probably for some reason, and he's gonna think that he knows a lot about Machiavelli. And he's gonna think that he's gonna be like, Ugh. Our politics today are so Machiavellian because he's not giving Machiavelli the Machiavelli the appreciation he's supposed to deserve. Because notice I said he said brutality, manipulation, and lying are condoned, not to his people, though. All right? That is not what he's saying. He's saying a ruler can do anything as long as the populace does not turn on him, right? So you can't be mean to your people, but you can be brutal to others. You can be brutal to other countries because you are trying to protect your persons, right? Your populace, okay? Because here's the most famous quote from Machiavelli's The Prince. Is it better to be feared or loved as a leader? Well, the rationalization is fear is a better emotion. If you are loved, you might be taken advantage of, but if you are feared, at least you keep order. But here's the kicker. Most people stop at that part of the quote. They're like, it would better be fair than love. And Mikey Valley was really mean. And he said all these mean things. And blah, 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 blah. He then went on to say in the rest of the quote, but he ought to avoid making himself hate it. Right? So he's saying it's better for your people to fear what you're capable of, but you shouldn't be hated. A lot of you have this fear of your parents, this Machiavellian respectful fear of your parents, right? You're not afraid of them like, like being mean to you regularly, but you're afraid of what they're capable of if you step out of line, right? So like that's a really important thing. So you can use examples of current, he used, oh, that's a big thing too. He rationalized this using examples of current leaders. One big one was this guy named Cesar Borgia, right? And Cesar Borgia led a city state to the east in Italy and he actually gave it good economic times and he progressed them financially and he also progressed their borders and he protected them from the Charles VIII invasions. And Cesar Borgia, ironically enough, fun fact though, to try and give you some understanding of how corrupt the papacy was at this time, was also the illegitimate son of Alexander VI, a pope, right? The pope that came before Julius II, the guy who got you know, Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And Alexander VI uh, and, <laughs> and Julius II like hated each other with a fiery passion, right? But Alexander VI also was a little bit sketchy because like I said, he was having illegitimate children, right? Cesar Borgia, because Alexander VI's real name was Rodrigue Borgia, right? So he wasn't supposed to be having kids if he's a priest, all right? So yeah, but remember, it's okay to be feared, but don't be hated, right? So that's a really important thing, right? Machiavellian, though, however, was kind of sexist, all right? Well, we talked about this, right? We talked about how a lot of these people during the time period were sexist, and that, like, nobody is purely good or purely bad, right? Like, so that's ridiculous to, like, have this kind of unjust duality, right? So Machiavellian was kind of sexist because he argued that, um, like women don't really have involvement in this rulership and that their government, their, women's ideas on government should kind of be kept to the sideline, which is super messed up, right? But he also argued that a government was not judged by God. They were actually judged by their ability to provide stability for their people, right? So whenever you're looking at a leader, a political leader, if they are more so universally loved, right? Like if they have like approval ratings in the high 70s and they are like considered great by their people, that is their judgment, not apparently by the church, right? So this is also kind of pointing the finger at the church, being like, you need to back up out of government, right? So with that, like a good example would be like, 
Dwight D. Eisenhower is considered a great president because his approval ratings were so high coming out of World War II. JFK was considered a great president because he was pretty universally loved by the populace during the 1960s, right? Before he was, of course, assassinated. Now, Machiavellian, though, became a term later on that kind of got messed up. When you hear someone use the term Machiavellian uh, falsely, they're usually referring to a ruler who's ruthless or cunning, right? So, or mean or sketchy. But that's not the way you should be using the word. A Machiavellian leader is somebody who protects his people before he protects others, right? You understand what I'm saying? Like, he is okay with starting a war if he feels like this might disenfranchise his people, right? So it's more about, like, how does he protect his citizens, okay? Because also, Machiavellian was being, like, really, really ironic throughout most of the, like, writing of the prince, right? And then, that is the, uh, that is civic humanism, right? So we need a new header. We need a new header, right? So we talked about civic humanism and how kind of like we talked about education with Castiglione and we talked about government with Machiavelli. And now we're getting into humanism and how it's going to affect, oh, I don't know, Christianity, right? We're going to talk about how it's going to affect Christianity because that is going to be an important thing, right? A lot of people right now are kind of starting to realize that Roman Catholic Church during the Renaissance era, it's a little bit corrupt. All right, so like, yeah, it seems like it's a little sketchy. We got folks having illegitimate children. We got Julius dying of syphilis, and we got Julius trying to take everything over, and we got like a lot of these sketchy popes kind of running around. We had Medici popes, too. Eventually, you're going to meet Leo X. He's a Medici. You're telling me that a family that has enough money can buy their way into the papacy and be the pope? That's ridiculous, right? So... During this kind of groundbreaking era where, you know, the church is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, uh, you're going to see a lot of humanists rise up that are going to start kind of being like, hmm, that's not appropriate. All right, so, and one big one is this guy, Sir Thomas More, who is an Englishman. Yes, Christian humanism is much more of a northern renaissance sphere, because here's what you need to understand. Before we ever get to the artwork, which is coming up this coming week, right? So make sure you know your art. Make sure you're ready to be like, oh, this is mine. And, then, blah, 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 and like, make sure you be able to like actually talk about your artwork. But what you're starting to realize is as we get closer to the 1500s, right? As we're getting out of the 1400s, because this course starts at 1450 tentatively. But once we start hitting the 1500s and we're in the middle of the high Renaissance, you're now starting to see a spreading of Renaissance ideas out of Italy and into the northern countries, right? Northern countries being the Holy Roman Empire, France, uh, England, uh, well, Ireland technically, yeah, but uh, the, where else? Um, France, Austria, right? Like uh, several other areas like that. Uh, Polish Lithuania, which is not gonna be around for long. Uh, but the big key thing is like, wait a minute, humanism is traveling, right? We talked about this being a really, really important concept that like the spread and dissemination of information during the Renaissance period is very, very important. And trade is going to be taking that a long way, but then also an invention that we're going to talk about next week is really important too. All right, so, sorry about that. We have prayer and announcements, right? So anyway, it's going to start spreading out there, right? And Renaissance humanism is going to begin to kind of break those borders of Italy and go over the Alps and into these other northern countries, right? Which I have over-aggressively talked about for way too long. Now, just to give you some perspective, Sir Thomas More is going to be a great... Christian humanist, right? Another varsity level humanist, Sir Thomas More, right? Now, he is an advisor to our boy. Where's he at? This guy, good old Henry VIII, right? So, Henry VIII, this was his first advisor, right? Sir Thomas More, a devout Catholic, very interesting perspective as well, uh, is going to be the advisor to King Henry, right? And so he is his religious advisor, okay? So as this religious advisor, he starts to kind of take this humanist perspective, though, and he's like, you know what? Catholicism is great, all right? So it's amazing. I will never be anything but a Catholic, right? Which actually also kind of ends up him losing his head, literally. Sir Thomas More is going to be executed by decapitation. Uh, we will talk about that later or in about two seconds. Um, but before, you know, his head's like rolling around on the scaffold, uh, he actually writes this book called The Utopia, right? And he publishes it in 1516, right? Now it is printed and starts to kind of make its way around. And in The Utopia, he starts to try and argue like Christianity and the values and the moral ideas of Christianity could possibly kind of take place on an island away from Europe, right? So he starts understanding this idea of like Christian morality being completely ingrained into a utopian community, right? 
And so he writes a fictional book, right? And in this fictional book, it takes place on an island, right? Far away from Europe. And like all about the utopia is like creating these perfect communities, right? Children all would get a great education. Adults would spend their day not trying to get economic gains, but doing labor, like tending a garden or helping their community, and then studying Greek literature in their off time, right? So not being necessarily a labor-based community, but being an intelligence and labor-based community, right? Also, in this entire thing, there were no social classes, so this concept of poverty was completely fixed because there wasn't any money, all right? So, like, everybody had to share everything. Everybody's property was communally shared. This sounds a lot like communism. Now, anyway, so, and you're not far off, right? But again, remember, it's supposed to be fictional. Now, anyway, like communism. Now, anyway, but getting into it, private property, gone, right? Everyone had to share everything. No disagreements were allowed ever. All things had to be managed between each other because they have yet to understand this perfect community. Fun fact, okay, so since all the money is gone, in the utopia, some of you are like, well, what are they going to do with, like, all the gold and all the liquid money that they had for a while? What are they going to do with that stuff? Yeah, they melted it down and turned it into toilets, all right? So, like, so toilets were made out of gold in the utopian community. Also, slaves and anybody who ever violated the utopian law would be shackled in gold chains, right? So because they were like, we don't need this money anymore, so let's use this metal, right? And so they used it to go to the bathroom and, and to bind people that broke the rules, right? Because it's like the book is written as a criticism. The book is written as a criticism to like society in general and the idea that we have derivated away from Christian thought and perspective, right? Because it criticizes the death penalty, even though, ironically enough, Thomas Poor is going to end up dying due to the death penalty. And it also criticizes this thing called the enclosure system, right? What I need you to do is I need you to highlight that word, the enclosure system, right? The enclosure system is going to come up again, but we do not have time to talk about it right now, okay? Because we're basically just going to like, throw it out there that the enclosure system was criticized by Sir Thomas More. So it's obviously something that could be misconstrued as being a bad thing, right? So another big thing about Sir Thomas More is he's also, uh, excuse me, is painted as a perfect place where no one has locked doors and the population is perfectly redistributed and all money and gains have been shared throughout everyone. However, ironically enough, every house had two slaves in Utopia. They used gold on the chains and toilets. And usually the slaves were actually people who had broken those rules, right? But the slaves could easily work for their freedom after they had repented their, their woes and misconduct, right? Another big thing was apparently uh, any type of premarital sex was punished with celibacy in the Utopia. Adultery was punished with enslavement, right? That is like our idea in this Utopia. Apparently, if you broke the rules of the Utopia, you would then be like enslaved, right? This is another interesting thing that was written in the Utopia by Sir Thomas More. He said that euthanasia is permissible. If somebody was dying of a terminal illness, instead of trying your best to keep them alive, if that person decided that they were ready to die to go meet God, right, and actually go be with God, then that was permissible, right? And then religious tolerance was accepted. This was really interesting as well. Thomas More believed that like our trying, like the Christian values in the Middle Ages had gotten away from this concept of treating men like other men and not casting that first stone of judgment, right? Allowing people to have their own religion if they so chose. And it even gave it out to pagans, right? Which is a very interesting like idea and dynamic, right? Now we got one more guy to talk about in the Christian humanist sphere who's really, really important. And his name is Desiderius Erasmus, right? Desiderius being his first name, okay? Now this guy's super important because you read about him in Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, right? So Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling talks about him being a very influential figure and someone who begins to criticize the papacy heavily, right? So Erasmus he kind of began his most active life in 1520, right? He is Dutch, all right? So he is going to be like kind of following right after Sir Thomas More. And in his ideas, he's going to begin to translate the Bible into vernacular language. Whoa, wait a second. Whoa, whoa, let's back it up a little bit. I know right now Grace is already firing off in her noggin. She's like, wait a second. If you're translating the Bible into vernacular language, that means that other people other than the priests and the Pope can read it, which means that you might have people running around just reading the Bible all willy-nilly. What's that going to do to the power structure of the church? It's now going to take the thing that they have and it's going to make it open to the public. Whoa, whoa, right? That's not okay to the Catholics, right? And though, ironically enough, 
this thought process, this idea of translating the Bible into vernacular language is going to be shared by a lot of Protestants during the Reformation. Uh, Erasmus actually stayed Catholic until the day he died. He just believed that Catholic people should be allowed to read the Bible if they want to, right? So he said, we need to start translating the Bible into languages that people can understand and they can read on their own. So he translated it into Greek, right? Which is a language that he could actually read, okay? So, and after translating it into Greek, he began to then advocate for like a childlike view of, of Christianity, right? This idea that Christianity should not be a checklist into heaven. It should be a soul-searching practice, right? He believed that the Catholic Church had kind of began to stray away from the idea of living a Christian value life, and he believed that they started getting more into like, okay, I got my baptism, and okay, I did my Eucharist, and okay, I did this, and okay, I did that, as a checklist to get into heaven, which is not the Catholic Church's fault during the Renaissance. A lot of that has to do with the placements of ideas in the Middle Ages, right? Because you're pitching an idea to people that can't read and write. You're like, oh, well, we need you to do these things, and then you can get into heaven to kind of try and create a, a base for devout worship. But Erasmus was saying, like, look, this is the Renaissance now. We do not need to just keep this like, okay, I did this, and okay, I did this, okay, I did this. We need a childlike view of it. We need to kind of look at it as like our faith and be an introspective thing that you can grapple with and struggle with at times, but then also sing, sing its praises, right? So he was also, check this out, he was a part of this thing called the Republic of Letters, right? So like jot that down, the Republic of Letters, which became this community in the Renaissance where hundreds of people, hundreds of humanists and hundreds of thought processing guys would begin to be like, oh, let's write to each other because everybody can now like is starting to read and write again, right? So they would begin to share these ideas with each other. And we'll talk about a guy that was a part of that Republic of Letters a little bit later. His name is Martin Luther, who you will also begin to talk about in religion at one point, who's kind of the guy that's the godfather of Protestant faith, right? So this Republic of Letters, though, that's where we have a lot of Erasmus' ideas, are these letters that he would write to other humanist thinkers, right? And in some of these letters, he advocated for that childlike view of Christianity. He also began to advocate for the fact that Bible text should be translated into vernacular languages. Like, let people read their faith, not necessarily have to depend on a priest who may or not even be able to, may not be that good at reading or writing Latin in the first place, right? So in this entire thing, he actually writes a very, very all-important document. That document he writes, write this down, it's called the Praise of Folly, all right? So, and in the Praise of Folly, he begins to kind of really like criticize the the road that uh, the road the Catholic Church has gone down, right? And in that same text, and as a part of that Republic of Letters, he begins to kind of poke fun at some of the popes in in Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, or excuse me, Michelangelo and the Pope's ceiling. He's the guy that said Keep Pope Julius will not be getting into heaven before other people. He will be standing out front of the door with a list of his sins that he has to atone for, right? So he's saying in this praise of folly that we've been praising the wrong idea because we are now in the Renaissance and we can kind of understand our faith better as a community. Right. So and with that, he believed that education led to reform. Right. Live like Christ, not checklisting your life. OK, so that is where we're going to stop. Right. And then on our next class, we are going to talk about the spread of ideas through printing. And we're also going to talk about how the Renaissance affected women in total. All right. So and I really wanted to save that one. I bumped that one to the end of this because I wanted to talk about that with you all in class a little bit. All right. But I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Y'all have a good one.